Hello, I'm Phil Svitek, 360 Creative Coach, and welcome to my blog, where it's my pleasure and mission to highlight my creative journey, so that way you can get takeaway, and also hopefully get some inspiration as well. But before I get into things, I would like to take the opportunity to invite you to subscribe if you haven't already, that way you get all the various lessons and episodes that I put out right when I put them out. Thank you if you just did, and thank you if you already were. It means a lot to me, it really does. So, last week, you know, uh, Thanksgiving week, uh, and overall, I will say, for the most part, you know, there, were, there was a lot of stuff I could have done, but kind of midway through the week, I was like, you know what, let's, um, let me just kind of take, pull, let me pull back and actually enjoy this week a little bit. So, you know, I was like, what's the stuff that, that I want to do, and what's the stuff that I don't need to do, uh, at least not right now, right? And so I took those things off and really just focused on the stuff I had to do and, and also just some major stuff I really, really wanted to do and get accomplished. So that was kind of my philosophy going into it and kind of, um, I'll, I'll really talk about uh, those specifics as I kind of dive deep into it. But uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about that I didn't uh, kind of the week that it happened um, just for one reason or another, it was uh, I I was part of a virtual um, p- uh, pitch competition. So for TV series, film, and things of that nature, my alma mater, Emerson College, they do a pitch competition for writers. And this is both for students as well as alum and industry people uh, judge it. You know, there, there's four judges, and they hear the pitches, and then they uh, give notes. And at the end, uh, you know, there's kind of a couple categories, the audience award, uh, the student award, the alum award, and so forth, right? And it, it was a lot of fun, right? So, you know, normally it, it's a little bit different. Obviously, like just the competition itself would have been in person under normal circumstances. This wasn't. This was all virtual, but still well-maintained um, via Zoom. And uh, the trick of it, unlike most pitches, this you, you have to deliver a pitch in 90 seconds, so a minute, and a, uh, you know, uh, a minute and a half, right? And generally, like when you actually do get a pitch, uh, you know, it it's kind of more like probably a 30 minute overall meeting. You know, um, you have, you know, you present the idea, and that's let's say 10 to 15 minutes, and then uh, Q and A stuff and whatever else, right? Uh, now. The reason why I like this um, kind of format, you know, Emerson College is a very prestigious college uh, in the film space. Um, There's there's the inside joke of anyone who's kind of really graduated from there is part of the Emerson Mafia because we look out for our own type of thing. Um, And it's also, you know, when you see Emerson on the resume, uh, you kind of know that someone's good at what they do, right? Um, It's no different than like, you know, you, you can say the same thing about, let's say, the USC or UCLA or... NYU or, you know, any number of schools, right? We all like to think we're the best. But but this is good. Um, and the reason I brought up kind of that aspect, the 90 second aspect, because, you know, when you're starting off, it, it can be very hard to get in that room to be able to pitch a longer form versus the 90 seconds. And in a lot of ways, it's it's almost behooves you to be able to boil your idea down to something a lot more shorter than, than a, you know, a 15 minute, 10 minute um, sort of, a version of it, right? And, you know, this obviously offered that opportunity. Um, And so, you know, I'm a a big fan of this. And, you know, the good news is, like, listen, you might be thinking, like, oh, he's talking about Emerson, Emerson. The good news is this isn't the only sort of pitch competition out there. There's, you you know, there's ones out there, and I would encourage you to check um, online for for the various kind of pitch competitions that that exist. and certainly, you know, this is a little bit different than like uh, uh, an actual script competition, which you you know you physically submit the script. This is this is purely based not necessarily on the writing, but more so how you present the writing, right? And what I appreciate, like it was it was a good learning um, aspect for me to really see just a slew of ideas, right? Number one, it was very inspiring to see so many people. I think um, fifteen people in total present over the course of you know a couple hours. And the wide range of thoughts that were there, and you know, sometimes you could see similar patterns. 
Um, sometimes you just saw a complete original, you know, so you start to kind of pick out what's a common theme and, you know, cliched versus what's an original aspect and, and whatever else. Um, and then certainly the, the notes by the judges, the four judges were very spot on, were very informative. Some takeaways as far as, you know, always kind of set the tone. Uh, so, you know, identify what the actual pitch is. Is it a TV show? Is it a miniseries? Um, all that other stuff. And, you know, and even to that effect, there was someone that made a, uh, kind of a thing that said, you know, mine's going to be a miniseries. And then they pitched. But the problem with the pitch was that, um, you know, it, there was no specific reason why it should be a miniseries as opposed to something that could keep going on and on. And, you know, that's good to know because a lot of times, of course, like studios will want to keep a project going if, you know, assuming that it is successful. And so it's like, unless there's a very specific reason why it needs to be a limited series in that regard, uh, it's like, why limit yourself, you know? If it's only meant to be three seasons, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to like outright say that. So that was kind of a cool, interesting little tidbit. And of course, wording, right? Wording matters. Um, the, 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 the adjectives that you use uh, hint towards a tone uh, and, and so forth, right? So if you use like a word whimsical, right? Whimsical implies, uh, uh, you know, perhaps farce, but definitely funny, right? Uh, it could be a parody and so forth. Um, as opposed to, you, you know, something much more kind of aggressive where, um, you know, you use so something along the lines of, let's say, a, a strong-minded, angry man. I don't know, right? But the idea is how, you know, you could describe, like, you could take one sentence, right? Um, and by, just by changing out the words in that sentence, you could shift the tone entirely. And there were some really good pitches, but they weren't as thoughtful with the specificity of, of the language. So it dictated towards something that was unintended. Uh, and so that's very key to, to really think about. So that was a kind of a, another cool thing. Uh, and, you know, the main thing, the, the other kind of aspect of it, when, when people were pitching for movies, it was much easier to talk about the plot um, especially in this 90 second kind of version, uh, you know, and introduce things that way versus if you were doing a TV show, it, it was better, at least in this regard, you know, it's a general rule of thumb, right? And nothing's like a solid law, but to talk about the characters and kind of situations because, you know, at the end of the day, the TV show, you, you know, you kind of want to talk about like what's the inciting incident of the TV show and then the characters because then you can envision various scenarios if you're the person listening to the pitch. Um... And so that, that was a kind of key takeaway, and, and I, thought, I thought it was really well done. And what was interesting, you know, the other reason why I'm really kind of talking about this is uh, one of the people that was the judges was a man named Jordan um, uh, Dinbana. And, and he is someone that I actually went to Emerson with, so he graduated around the time uh, that I did, right? And it was very interesting, um, you know, kind of seeing him, and it was really cool. And I wasn't jealous at all. It was just really cool to see, you know, people that I had went to college with. Because, I mean, first off, it's all Emerson people. So that was inspiring enough. But to see somebody literally from, like, my grade uh, to be a judge because of his worthiness, uh, I thought was really cool. You know, he currently he's working on uh, the, the reboot or whatever you want to call it of Animaniacs. Um, and so he, in his own right, is a very, you know, he's a writer. So he's more on the you know, him as a judge, he was more of a person that pitches a lot to people um, versus like someone uh, listening to the pitches. But it was cool to have his perspective because he's someone who's, you know, sold shows this way. And so it's really cool. Uh, and, and another reason why I'm kind of really talking about him is because uh, on his website, he does, he has these like weekend scripts. And what it is, is it's basically like kind of, uh, you know, Hollywood blockbuster type movies, but with a, with a twist that he ends up writing within a weekend. And I thought, uh, that's really kind of cool. You know, it's, it's not like these are like his ideas and obviously they're kind of riddled with cliche and so forth, but it, it allows him to, to exercise certain things. And as Seth Godin says, you know, you never really have writer's block. And whenever someone says they have writer's block, he always tells them, show me all your bad writing. And what I respect about kind of this is that you know, he's able to make some parodies, which is, you know, he's much more of a comedy writer. And so it's a great use of his muscle. And, you know, 
it's like writing fan fiction, but, but you know, elevated fan fiction, and you can get it out of a system, and people kind of can see it and laugh at it and enjoy it. And um, just in and of itself, it's a very sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's a thing that you can see, and it's like, you know, will, will any of these movies be made? No, but, but, but like in and of itself, the scripts themselves are like the end product, and that can, you know, both attract fans as well as, you know, people within the industry. I certainly, you know, latched onto it. I was like, this is really cool. And so, you know, one of the things in general about like just any sort of aspect of, of, of any business really, but certainly the entertainment industry is people like when people are step up, you know? And so, or, or like when people, people are doing things. And so even in his downtime, the fact that he does these like weekend scripts, and he's, it's not like he's done one or two, he's done a good number of these. I would venture to say uh, 10 plus. And so, you know, you kind of look at that and you're like, okay, this guy's this guy's really dedicated, you know? And if he's able to do this with, you know, uh, just kind of as a creative outlet, imagine what he, he can really do once he gets the resources and it's it's the right fit and so forth. And certainly like right now for him, Animaniacs is, is, is that thing. So it's a, it's a really cool aspect and, you know, that's why I'm a big advocate of just keep putting out stuff into the world. You know, of course, like, you know, put, you know, uh, use discretion, you don't want to just put out garbage, but at the same time, I think people just get so hampered by the word quality that it's like, what does quality even mean? It's, it's not up to you to judge the quality, you know, put your best foot forward, but it's really the audience that can make that determination, right? So, you know, um, and the other aspect of it was just, uh, you know, it's it, in, in that sense, whether it's Jordan or anyone else, I'm noticing that I'm reconnecting with a lot of people from my past. And it's really cool because, you know, there's people that I got to work with and you think like, you know, some things are seasonal, like you're never going to work with somebody again, not because, you know, you don't like them or whatever, but just life takes you on a different path. And then other times, like you, it's interesting to see who you get reconnected with and, and whatever else. And, um, you know, it's something you don't appreciate as a kid simply because obviously you can't pull your, um, from your own memory bank or, or examples of it because, you know, you're too young to kind of have lived through it. But, you know, now me as a 32 year old, there's enough instances where, you know, people leave my life for a little bit and then we reconnect and all of a sudden, boom, sparks are flying as far as, you know, creativity and working on stuff or just mutual admiration, you know? Um, that in and of itself, I think is very underrated. It's like, we don't have to work on stuff together, but the fact that like, you know, that we now are recognizing each other of like, wow, you've done this and I'm doing this. And, you know, for example, my, one of my friends, Nate Cormier, he's doing a lot of stuff with like, um, Lucasfilm and in particular Star Wars stuff. And it's like, wow, that's, that's really cool what he's getting to do, you know? And he's like, oh, but it's cool that you're doing this. And like, and it's like, oh, that's awesome. And, and I just don't think we celebrate that enough of like each other's victories. Uh, so that, that was something that was, you know, really cool. Um, all right. So as far as like last week specifically, you know, the, the main thing that, you know, I talked about at the start of last week, you know, in the last vlog that I want to refocus and um, work on the how-to book, you know, the making, making of essentially Idol, my first feature film, as well as updating my uh, Master Mental Fortitude book. And I was going to kind of get started on that, but I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't need to start right now, this week. That's, those are great goals and things like that, but, but I can kind of, I can ease off the accelerator on this one for this week. So instead, I focused on, you know, let me revise In Search of Sunrise, my, my script that I want to make as my second feature. And so, you know, uh, Jason was my co-writer. He was working on it, and then he had completed the draft and sent it to me, and you know, I read it on my iPad and with the, uh, the, the, the Apple pen, you know, I marked it up of like, okay, change this. Blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, over the weekend, I really went through and really tackled it. Some of it was easy stuff as like grammar and spelling mistakes. Others was like, you know, shifting a scene from here to here or just the tone and stuff like that. But man, it's, you know, I will, I'll, I'll keep saying it. The revision process to me and for anybody really is far easier because our minds are much more critical than they are creative. And so it's, it's a lot easier to, to fix something, obviously that's written versus having to write it from scratch. And so um, 
you know, the fact that I was able to blow through the entire, because there was a lot of changes that I had in my mind, um, but the fact that I was able to go through them uh, in, in basically like a four hour session was, uh, was pretty phenomenal. Certainly I can't write a whole script in four hours. Um, even just like the physical act of typing, I don't think I'd be able to do that. Uh, maybe I would, I don't know. Never say never, right? But nonetheless, you get the point. Um, so I'm very proud of that. But I will admit, you know, one of the things kind of, it, it was funny, like on Thanksgiving day, you know, I had so much to be grateful for, but the thing that like really like, Sometimes, you know, you just focus on like the bad problem. And what I had done, I miscalculated um, uh, a kind of equation to budget out, you know, an estimation of what the animation for the movie would cost. And for me, if you're unfamiliar, what I want to do is kind of make it in the style of Scanner Darkly, Waking Life, or, you know, even Amazon's Undone TV series. And, you know, it's basically how that works is you film it in live action and then and then you paint over it, and so it, it, it looks like an animation, but it's also half lifelike and creates this cool effects. So I had kind of budgeted out where essentially, you know, the price that I was given, I thought was based off per second. It's actually based off per frame. And so, you know, uh, a second is vastly different than a frame because you have 24 frames in a given second and times that and, and essentially like, you know, what it came out to was essentially like roughly on average, you know, somewhere in the hour and 40 minute range, it would end up kind of being, let's say like, you know, I'll round up 150,000 frames. Well, at the cost of, you know, even like $1.50 per frame, that ends up being quite a lot. So, you know, the, the budget just for animation was going to range anywhere from 200,000 to like 500,000. It's like, whoa. Okay, um, my thinking was like we would get this made for seventy thousand dollars, which is already high enough number for me. Um, but you know, uh, we can't just to have a budget for animation two hundred to five hundred. And granted, like in the grand scheme of things, that's actually really cheap for animation, right? But you know, my whole goal that I'm trying to kind of work towards, and I, I proved with my first uh, feature film, Idol, was I want to be able to make the art that I want to make. Um, Unrestrained, right? Like if I want to make something, I can make it, right? Um, of course, I need my, you know friends and friends on board and things like that. But um, but using creativity as as the solution versus finances. So you know what, you know I was kind of in down place. I was like, oh man, am I going to be able to make the movie that I want? You know, like that's that's a lot of money. I don't think I can. I I feel like you know seventy thousand dollars in and of itself is a stretch to you know try to make. Uh, you know, just 200,000, you know, is a stretch and that's just for the animation. So, uh, you know, I was kind of bummed out, but I, I, I called my friend Jonathan Moulton, um, on Friday and, and we chatted and he's a, he's a whiz. He's a techie, um, lover like me, except like he's, you know, far exceeds it, you know, in terms of graphics and visual effects and so forth than me. Uh, and he was saying, oh, like this could actually, you know, this could be done. And so, you know, we were talking about applying filters within After Effects. Um, there's a way to do that. But I think the route that we're kind of more intrigued by currently, you know, is, is, is this idea that in Photoshop, right, uh, you know, I looked up various tutorials of how to take a real image and make it into a cartoon. And... You know, for the most part, that yielded better results than than the filter with an After Effects. Not 100% in terms of what we were going for. So, you know, I said to him, like, we'll have to we'll have to play around with it to get it exactly where we want it. But what you can do is, once you have it, you can what's called record an action, right? So, literally within Photoshop, you can select record um, and an and action. And what it does is it remembers all the steps you take within a given document. So the idea being, once we know exactly how we're going to like create this template, because it's all, you know, filters and so forth, then we record uh, that action. And then once we're done with it, we stop and we save it as, you know, animation action or whatever. And because at the end of the day, a movie, all it really is, is a bunch of still images sequenced together. Well, you know, whether it's Premiere or Avid or Final Cut, it doesn't matter. You can export out what's called an image sequence. 
And what's beautiful about that is then my idea is, okay, we take that and, you know, we batch it through Photoshop applying, you know, the saved action and it'll do this. Now, how long that's going to take for, you know, let's say 150,000 uh, individual pictures, you know, we'll see. I might have to ha dedicate a whole computer just for a few months just to, to run this nonstop, but at least it's doable and it, you know, once, once the action is created, then it's free, right? Um, and that's the beautiful thing. So it's like, oh, that, that can work. And the nice part about this is, you know, because you're ultimately, it's going to be an animation. Even the, you know, we could shoot against green screen for some of the stuff that we can't like actually get. And so you can create the background however you want. You just need the objects that they interact with need to physically be in that space. But, but the backgrounds can be swapped out to however we want. And so, and you don't even have to get the, like, normally when you're working on a movie, you don't, have, you have to kind of really make sure to get the green screen correct um, in, in terms of how you key it in. But the beautiful part is you don't have to, like, get it that, that detailed because with the animation applied over it, it's not really going to matter. Um, and so that to me is, is a beautiful thing. Uh, so that's kind of how we're approaching this. And we're going to, we're going to have a production meeting tomorrow, not just about the animation, but you know, locations, casting, budget, how we're going to finance. And one of the things that, you know, now is kind of the next phase of it. I'm also looking into film grants. I'm looking into partnering with certain, um, production companies, uh, you know, through people that I know and ultimately like, you know, $70,000 is not that much money, um, in terms of a movie, but, but so it's like, can I, you know, you know and, and I, one of the things I've been doing is preparing a pitch deck. And so it's like, what are c comparable, movies around that same budget and how much did they make and so forth so that way we can make part of the pitch and, and really lure um ideally someone uh to to help us out with this you know so I'm, I'm looking forward to that next next step um and so yeah it was it was good to kind of go from like a small defeated moment to you know this idea that that there are solutions and you know it's interesting People talk about like, oh, that's a risky endeavor or something like that. Well, it's, it's only risky at the beginning, right? Uh, risk means there's there's problems to overcome and you have to kind of over, overcome them. Certainly when people looked at me as far as Idol, my first movie was concerned, it seemed quote unquote risky because it's like, oh, so you're going to film in downtown LA and you're just going to kind of go for it and film all these scenes and you know how's this going to work? And it's like, okay, that seemed like a risky endeavor. But once you really start breaking it down and solve problem by problem, it's not as risky as, as it may sound, and it, it worked quite well, and everyone was like, oh, damn, this is actually pretty easy. And so, you know, in that respect, you know, when you tell people you want to make an, you know, rotoscope animated movie, and, you know, uh, I'm not at liberty to talk about the subject matter, or at least I, I don't want to at this moment, but, you know, it's a very deep and heady kind of thing, and, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, stuff going on, right? It's, 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 an, it's, for all intents and purposes, it's quite an ambitious film. So it's like, how the hell is this going to be pulled off? And, you know, certainly, my, 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 you know, uh, like I had far more greater confidence going into Idol than I ever did with this. Um, but you know what? You know, uh, in order for me to grow as a filmmaker, I got to, you know, I got to have a little bit of fear in my life, uh, so to speak. And so the fact that, uh, you know, I had a little bit of trepidation and, and was like, how the hell are we going to pull this off? It means I'm going in the right direction. And rather than like be, be crippled by it, you know, my mind's gone to solutions. And part of those solutions is asking people around me that, that, you know, are my friends and so forth and being like, hey, do you have an idea? Do you have an idea? Like, what can we do? And um, so I'm looking forward to that. And I'll, you know, I'll continue talking about that. Obviously, I'll update next week in terms of how the production meeting went and so forth. And then other than that, you know, Thanksgiving was fun um, in the sense, obviously, it's a very different Thanksgiving this year. Um, I was with my friend Dimitri. Uh, if, if you guys are not familiar, we did anatomy and movie together for a number of years and I was in his backyard. And it was just, you know, us two here in LA, um, safe, distanced outside. Um, it was fun. It was, it was fun to chat. It was kind of fun to catch up. Um, and yeah, that, that was kind of overall, overall it. Um, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing. That's what I'm up to. Obviously, you know, other stuff in there as well, but, uh, but not worth boring you over, if you will. 
Um, anyway, that's that's what I have. So I, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to go on this journey with me. Uh, if, if you have any questions, it could be about anything that I talked about. It could be about stuff I didn't talk about. By all means, please ask away in the comments section or hit me up on social media at Phil Svitek. I would love to chat with you. I hope you know that by now. Also, if you think this or any other content that I put out would be a benefit to somebody, please share it with them. I certainly would appreciate it. I appreciate you. I'll see you next time.